thought it'd be interesting to get a little uh, election and economic perspective. And our speaker today is Steve Pavlik. He's a partner and head of policy at Renaissance Macro. Uh, Steve helps buy side clients identify opportunities, price political, legislative, and regulatory risk in today's dynamic public policy environment. Um, Steve also produces every morning in my email probably the best aggregate of all the news of the day, politics, economics, and finance. Um, it, it's spectacular. And, uh, and Steve and I went to college together, so we have uh, enough blackmail material for mutually assured destruction. Please welcome Steve. Thank you. Uh, well. All right, well, thank you all first for having me today. I have to get used to calling him Francis, as you all know him, because back in college, I remember the Frank the Tank that may or may not have inspired the old school character, something uh, maybe we can talk about after the presentation. Um, but quickly, when you talk about a midterm electorate, okay, you're traditionally talking about who is more motivated to come out. You're also historically talking about a smaller, older, whiter, uh, college-educated electorate. Historically, the party out of power tends to be more motivated to come out to the polls. Um, and I think what we're seeing reflected right now is the possibility of something resembling more of a presidential election electorate, uh, because both parties right now are energized. The other thing to keep an eye on, too, is just sort of this question of maybe shifting demographics. You know, Democrats have made a lot of gains in recent elections with college-educated voters. So that might actually benefit them more this time at the polls. Also, Republicans have also made gains with Latino voters. When you talk about competitive states, which we'll get to in a moment, in Arizona, that could make a difference at the margins, which is where a lot of these close contests are going to be won or lost. In terms of older voters, I think there's an argument to be made that they have been hurt disproportionately by inflation, watching their retirement savings and cost of living be eroded. Uh, so in terms of motivation for them, I suspect that they'll likely prioritize the economy. A lot of discussion here about the generic ballot, which simply asks, which party do you plan to vote for? Does not mention candidate names. Uh, it tends to be a little bit more reliable of a predictor compared to presidential approval ratings, which we'll get to in a second. Uh, and you've seen some shifts. Democrats had a large lead earlier in the year. Then Republicans actually had sort of a small lead, I think, in November. Now they're more or less at parity. I checked before I came out here today because a lot of these numbers were taken Monday when I had to submit the charts. Uh, but Democrats do have a one percentage lead there. Uh, but just keep in mind, this is a national poll, so it's not always predictive in terms of certain states. Um, and also, one thing I would flag is I look a lot at the averages. They tend to reduce some of the biases here. But there's a big variation. I've seen a lot of polls that are comprising these averages that shows Democrats up by as much as five, Republicans up as much as five. Uh, and I think one thing to help uh, sort of factor this in is this thing that 538 polling firm produced. You see it's probably hard to, to look at. Uh, but you sort of see, in terms of their analysis here, what they were able to do in terms of the mean reverted bias over time. So you see certain polls tend to be a little Democrat friendly, certain polls that tend to be Republican friendly, something just to consider uh, when you're sort of weighing these things. I mentioned presidential approval rating. That tends to have a correlation with the midterm results. That correlation tends to be much higher in terms of the House rather than the Senate. Just looking back at our most recent midterm in 2018, I believe Democrats won 40 or 41 House seats. Republicans actually picked up two Senate seats. Uh, one thing I would uh, keep in just in your back pocket here was a report by the Cook uh, Political Report that actually looked at how Democrats were able to run ahead of presidential candidates. And they found more or less a ceiling around 5%. So if Biden's in the 43%, will they sort of be maybe capped there at 48%? Not an advantageous position if you're an incumbent, but something to keep an eye on. Gallup poll, new one came out this week. So this one's actually already outdated, but didn't move much. Had Biden at 42%, which is down a little bit. Uh, but I will point out this uh, historical trend there that the average loss for a president with approval rating below 50% is 37. You sort of see this chart here. Uh, 
pull live from the University of Virginia. I'm a Darden grad. It's nice of you all to, to let me in despite that. But you can sort of see how Biden's uh, approval rating sort of tracks here amongst these events. The other thing I would note is we sort of see this surge here, um, sort of the end of the summer in July, beginning of August. There was some momentum. You had gas prices coming down. It started with a five, then it was down to a three. You also had Democrats actually passing some legislation may have motivated some disenfranchised Democrats to come home, a theme we'll talk about a little later. Uh, but I think the more concerning thing is now you're starting to see it sort of flatline here. So if there was hopes that you know, his approval rating would pick up and continue to accelerate, I'm not sure that trend's going to happen. In terms of polling reliability, this has been a big issue uh, the past few elections. And I think both sides have some things to point to looking uh, ahead to this one. Polling is really important because it drives turnout. People aren't as motivated to come out if they think their vote's not going to matter, that their candidate's destined to lose. It's also very important in terms of driving fundraising numbers. Uh, you know, 2020 was historically very bad uh, in terms of polls, and there's several factors for that. You know, some attribute it to more Democrats being home, responding to pollsters' calls. Some people attribute it to just Republicans not participating. Trump had clearly <laughs> villainized a lot of polls and media firms that were conducting these. So it was very difficult for them to sort of account for this. Um, and then I don't know necessarily at the time they were able to predict what the voting by mail would look like. We saw a lot of uh, election rules change as a result of the pandemic. And I don't know that pollsters were necessarily able to capture that last year. Uh, in terms of midterms, 2018 was uh, a little easier to capture. Uh, so there is some hope there. But going back to where we started the conversation, if it is going to be a, more of a presidential electorate, maybe there could be some uh, questions here with respect to the accuracy. Now, on the Democrat side, in terms of some of the recent elections they've had, particularly since the Dobbs decision, they've actually overperformed polls. When you look at what happened with the Kansas ballot initiative, uh, as well as some of the competitive uh, House seats, uh, where they either you know, were able to beat a favored Republican or definitely uh, run a much closer race than anticipated. So it is possible, if you're hopeful, if you're a Democrat, that maybe pollsters have overcorrected for this, uh, and there could be some hope ahead. Ticket splitting. Uh, this just refers to when people vote for candidates uh, for different positions from different political parties. We've seen growing nationalization and polarization in our politics. And as a result, most people now just draw, vote straight down ballot. I'm going to vote all Republican, all Democrat. Just tell me what to do, and I'll, and I'll do it. Now, one thing that could be more of a factor this time is, we'll talk about it more in a bit, is the abortion issue. That's now being decided at states, which could take more of a precedent uh, priority for, for voters as they go to the ballot this year. Uh, I question whether you know, people will vote for a different uh, candidate for Democrat from a different party uh, versus a Republican, you know, potentially for, for the Senate there. Uh, we'll get into some of these races, but I think there's an opportunity potentially for a popular uh, governor or a gubernatorial candidate to maybe carry a less popular Senate candidate across the finish line. If we talk about the House, and again, I'll point out, we talked about that correlation from presidential approval rating here. I also want to just note here at the bottom this uh, seats in trouble. You know, you have 36 for Democrats, 11 for Republicans. We're talking about Republicans needing four, depending on the latest, maybe five seats to get a majority. That's not much. And again, historically, about 25, 26 seats uh, lost by the president's party. And um, I, I just think between redistricting, which arguably, we'll get to that in the next chart, gave Republicans, presumably the five, four or five seats they need to get to, uh, and also the number of Democrats that chose to retire this year. You see that that number is much higher for them as of June uh, compared to Republicans. When you look at where those retirements came from, they also tended to be from more competitive seats compared to where Republicans were deciding to retire from. So margins matter in terms of governing. You know, I think you've just seen that with Speaker Pelosi having uh, difficulty at times corralling her caucus. Uh, if Republicans have a narrow majority, I assume if it's Speaker McCarthy, which may not be the, the right assumption, we'll see how that goes, but he will have a difficult time keeping that group together. And then just again, just sort of seeing what the results here were in terms of redistricting. Senate evenly split. Usually you have about a third uh, of senators up every two years. This year was a little higher because we had a few additional retirements. Uh, incumbents, 
tend to have the advantage, um, much easier for them to defend. They also are able to raise a lot more money usually. Democrats have a favorable map. You have, as you see, you know, 21 here versus uh, 14. Now, many of the contentious races here are actually Democrat held, which I think speaks to this broader environment, which we'll talk a little bit more about here in a second. But looking ahead to 2024, what you see here is that Republicans have a very favorable map. You have more than twice as many Democrats up uh, in 24 compared to Republicans. And you also have several in states that Trump won or Biden narrowly carried. So going back to that theme we just talked about of ticket splitting, if you're a Republican and you have a good chance at winning the White House in 2024, if a Republican candidate does prevail there, they will likely have a Republican Senate to work with and potentially a much larger one. So see some of the Senate projections here, uh, sort of have Virginia in the camp of going towards Democrats. Uh, that would be one pickup opportunity. Now, these are both held by Democrats now. So if that sort of played out here and Republicans were able to win in Georgia or Nevada, uh, that would give them control. And you see some of the gubernatorial races, some of the projections. Again, in terms of the competitive seats that overlap here with the Senate contest, Pennsylvania, and yeah, we'll talk about that in terms of being able to benefit the Democrats there. But Arizona, Nevada, that's really important there for the Republican candidate. These were the ratings, again, disclosure as of Monday. Uh, but again, you sort of have more the right leaning, real clear politics with their averages. Uh, some of these have changed. Actually, Nevada, I was just checking before I came down, has moved slightly ahead for Republicans in both. Um, and then you have 538, which tends to skew a little left, giving their probabilities of winning. And so you can point to something like uh, Wisconsin, which is interesting because you sort of have the Democrat there with the lead, but 538 suggesting that the Republican can incumbent there is likely to win. That is a reflection of a history of poor polling there in Wisconsin, particularly with Senator Ron Johnson. So I think sometimes it's interesting just to see how the averages match up with the probabilities. In terms of the economy, that is still rated the top issue for most voters, typically much more high on the list of priorities for Republicans, but also independents. If you're an independent, you have three options, Republican, Democrat, or stay home. If they decide to come out, I think we're all sort of trying to anticipate what is going to be their priority there. Based on the polling, it suggests the economy is likely to be uh, the highest issue for, for them. In terms of inflation, from a political standpoint, it impacts everybody the same way, very negatively in terms of reducing their purchasing power. Also, when you look at a poll from The Economist, most respondents actually rate the prices they pay as the most important indicator in terms of how they judge the economy. You have the Biden administration pointing to gains uh, with respect to the job market. I think from a political standpoint, you know, that sounds nice. It's a good thing to point to. It matters mostly to those who don't have a job. Again, the inflation impact on everybody is just very difficult to overcome. Biden's also pointed to the decline in gases. We touched on that a little earlier, but that's sort of being offset by rising prices elsewhere. We have the LNG issue, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a second, but also anybody who's been to a grocery store, you know, I buy the groceries in my family, used to pay, it started with a one every week, now it's a two or a three. That still remains elevated. I think that's an important issue. It's very difficult to message that a slowing economy is a sign of progress. And I think going back to the whole transitory debate early on, uh, there's some credibility challenges there on that, which is why Democrats are preferring to talk about more abortion and raise that as an issue of concern. You had the Supreme Court ruling returning the decision to the states, so I assume more blue states will expand access, red states will probably place more restrictions moving forward, uh, and we have seen Democrats in the elections since the Dobbs decision overperform expectations. I think that's giving them hope. And this Kansas ballot initiative, the one thing I wanted to highlight there is that was solely on this issue. And presumably, if that is a priority to you, you are more motivated to go out. When people are going to the election, uh, I'm sorry, to vote this fall, they're going to have a whole host of issues. So in terms of where this falls on people's priorities, it's going to be really important to see how that is decided. There's also a question of duration. A lot of these elections occurred very close to that decision. Will that intensity remain as we get to November? Polling now suggests it will, um, but again, that's gonna be very important in terms of deciding the, the outcome here. There was a bill released by Senator Lindsey Graham. I think that sort of recognized that Republicans felt 
they needed to respond on this issue. We often say the highway to hell is paved with good intentions. I suspect that he wanted to try to give something for Republicans to sort of point to to respond. However, that undermined their argument before that the decision should be decided by the states, which is why I think you saw a lot of Republicans sort of fail to embrace it. Student loan decision, um, you know, I thought it was interesting timing that Biden decided to do this before the election. Um, I suspect that it was intended to try to motivate younger voters, sort of thinking cynically the way you do in DC. Um, I can't help but think they may be assuming that the Supreme Court may strike this down and take it away. Anger is a more powerful motivator. So if you already thought people might be motivated to vote on this issue based on receiving it, they may be even more mo motivated to vote if it's actually taken away, if they feel that benefit's taken away. It's not clear to me, though, that when you look at a broader populace, what the popularity is here. I think that's one of the reasons that you've seen some Democrats distance themselves from this. It's one of the reasons that legislation has often been avoided here, because it does anger a lot of people who either base their decision on where to go, on where they could afford, um, you know, where they apply a similar standard to their children, uh, or if they didn't go to college and being asked to subsidize that. So I think going back to the economy, Biden had sort of made an argument here on the Inflation Reduction Act, that money could be used to pay down the deficit. Adding a lot of this sort of goes against that. Um, so something to keep an eye on as well. Trump, he can't talk any election without him, I guess. Um, if you're the Democrats, you would much rather make this a choice election rather than a referendum. We talked about historically why that would be the case. You've had the January 6th hearings, the Mar-a-Lago raid, uh, all, you know, under 100 days from the election. Clearly, you want to keep Trump elevated in the news. He motivates Democratic voters. If you want to get him out there, that seems to be the, the play. If you're a Republican, your hope is that it will motivate Trump voters that may have been less inclined to come out here, and that you will not alienate suburban voters who may still be prioritizing uh, the economy. But the challenge is you're often asked if you're a Republican candidate right now about Trump and to react to what he said or did, rather than taking that opportunity to sort of criticize Biden on the economy. Um, We'll talk more about 2024 in a, in a sec. Um, in terms of the consensus view, again, this was as of, of Monday, but I don't think this has changed a whole lot, maybe around the margins here on some of the percentage changes, but most people are anticipating a split decision with Republicans capturing the House for a lot of the reasons we outlined uh, and Democrats likely retaining control of the Senate. Uh, and you see, I would consider pretty high probabilities there, around 70% for for both. I did think it was interesting, just in terms of predicted, the online betting markets. You know, it had the possibility earlier, uh, a few weeks ago, of either unified control for Democrats or Republicans, about even. That's shifted a little bit more now in the favor of Republicans, but still overwhelmingly uh, a, a split decision there. In terms of um, what the generic ballot indicator might be, according to the University of Virginia Center for Politics, uh, a one-point lead there, which is actually where it was this morning. Uh, they anticipate a one-seat gain for Democrats in the Senate and 15 House uh, Republican seat pickups, which again reinforces this whole split decision narrative. However, real clear politics in terms of their forecast, they actually have Republicans getting to 52 seats. So again, not um, I'd say more of a consensus, but not everybody's in, in entirely in this camp. In terms of what this means moving forward, if you have one party control of Congress, you have uh, the potential for, if you're the Democrats, legislative risk and options remain on the table. Now, if Republicans are able to get control of this, the possibility of legislation is basically off the table. And if you have Republicans picking up control of the Senate, that is presumably a, a better election outcome than predicted. And the question is how Biden would react to that. If you look at the two most recent Democratic candidates, you have two different very rea uh, reactions. Bill Clinton, 94, suffered large electoral losses, pursued the policy of triangulation. Okay, decided to move himself politically between Republicans and Democrats in his own party. Worked with Republicans to pass some things, did not work with them to do some other things. Uh, went on to win re-election, so I guess you can't argue with uh, the results. Compared with Barack Obama, suffered electoral losses in 2010, sort of went into campaign mode, went on to win re-election. I guess you can't argue with the results there. 
I suspect Biden would be more likely to follow the Obama camp. He served in that administration, as did a lot of his people. Um, but that also depends on whether or not he's going to run again. There's also the possibility that Republicans sort of overplay their hand. That's the 98 example where Democrats actually were able to make some gains in the midterms because Republicans were seen as, um, again, overplaying their hand and pursuing uh, some of the impeachment proceedings there. If Democrats maintain control, which is sort of the, the status quo, um, the legislative risk remains. And from a financial perspective, if you're the Fed, it would be very interesting if you're trying to raise interest rates and Democrats are providing additional fiscal stimulus. Might that prompt you to raise rates even further? Um, it's an interesting thing to, to ponder. I don't know that we're going to have to deal with that, but definitely something to, to consider. Okay. Divided government is the most likely scenario, even just with the Republican House. Um, you are taking that prospect for fiscal stimulus off the table. If you're the Fed, you have to think about that. If we are in a recession, uh, to only have the monetary lever is something that is going to weigh very heavy on uh, the, the Fed and, and, and policymakers. Now, from a political perspective, your job is to deliver on your campaign promises. And if you have that legislative pathway blocked, that means more emphasis on executive agencies to follow through on these rules. And that's one of the reasons that we've seen such an issue, or such an emphasis, rather, on packing the courts with more partisan judges on both sides. If Democrats have the Senate, they can still repopulate people to serve in these agencies and carry out their agenda. If you have a Republican Senate, they have no interest in confirming these people. And if they are, they're going to be much more moderate and less likely to pursue those agencies. We still have the ultimate arbiter, 6-3 uh, conservative Supreme Court, um, but I would expect a lot more legal challenges there. In terms of international challenges, regardless of control, these are things that policymakers are going to have to deal with. We talk about global recession fears, uh, what that means in terms of a strong dollar. If you are a country, uh, particularly an emerging market country, with a lot of dollar-denominated debt, it's very difficult to pay that back. In terms of the upcoming elections here in China, um, you know, it looks like Xi Jinping. I expect he's going to get a, a third term here. Um, and I don't know that this risk in terms of a Taiwan invasion goes away. I think he's about 69 years old. He's talked about reunification being a priority, presumably under his watch. If you look at just biologically what that timeline is, maybe something within the next 10 years. In terms of intelligence reports, it's been reported that China hopes to have the capability to seize Taiwan by 2027. Doesn't mean they'll necessarily act on that, but in terms of where they're spending their military, uh, spending on their military and their capabilities, that is what the target they're, they're striving for. Uh, in terms of a porcupine strategy, that might be Taiwan's lesson here from the invasion in Ukraine. If you can go ahead and sort of fortify yourself, what make it very much more difficult for Beijing to execute that amphibious invasion. Uh, there's also the potential that you know, Beijing recognizes that and they might accelerate their invasion plans to prevent from Taiwan from getting to that point. So a lot more questions and answers here, but I suspect this risk isn't going away anytime soon. On a more positive economic uh, front in terms of China, it's believed once they get past the People's Congress that that will uh, free Xi up politically to maybe roll back some of the uh, zero COVID restrictions that could impact oil markets as well as the, the economy abroad. Uh, I don't know it's necessarily going to be right away, but uh, definitely, again, likely to come uh, sooner, I think, rather than, than later after that election. In terms of the Ukraine situation, it was interesting to put this in here Monday. We've seen a lot happen uh, since then uh, in terms of Putin doubling down. Uh, I don't know that he would have been making that speech um, had he thought he was winning the war, but most conflicts end in terms of a lack of political will on one side. Uh, and a negotiated uh, solution. I think the best case scenario would be after Russia holds these elections, and some of the seized elections in quotes, uh, in terms of some of the seized territories they had in Ukraine uh, through this weekend and early next week. It's possible that you know Putin may say, look, I'm willing to negotiate now that I've officially seized these territories. You know, Zelensky has publicly said he will not uh, you know, agree to, to, to cede any territory to, to Putin. In terms of public posture, I don't blame him for that. I don't know if that's a practical position, uh, but that would be the best case scenario that actually kicks off a formal negotiating position. Uh, it's very difficult for Putin to walk away without some measure of progress, some form of increased territory. Uh, so that will be important to watch. Worst case scenario is now that 
Putin has seized its territory. He uh, declares it Russian land, and that's his justification for escalating the type of military response he might uh, use. So again, I don't know that's going away. In terms of the energy impact, have Putin already weaponizing LNG. That is creating more demand from Europe on the supplies here from the US, which aren't exactly increasing as much as they need to be. That's driving prices up. If you're an LNG producer, Europe's willing to pay you three times as much. It makes sense to sell them that. That's why you're seeing prices going up here. If you're the White House, it's a very difficult political position. You have some Democratic senators already pressing Biden to restrict exports abroad because they don't want the prices to go up on their constituents. But if you do that, that's going to make it very difficult for your allies to stay unified there. So I don't envy them in terms of how they decide to pursue that. I think this, friend, uh, this trend of friend shoring and near shoring is likely to continue. You see a lot of incentives to try to encourage investment here in the US. But if not in the US, at least in a country that is deemed friendly. So this broader theme of decoupling. We have, again, the, the incentives here. If you look at the CHIPS Act that was passed, um, I, I think that's uh, what they would like to try to do in terms of other um, industries. In terms of moving existing facilities, that can be cost prohibitive. But when you look at the future investment decisions, there's a real conscious desire to do that. Uh, when we get into the supply of maybe the materials needed for this clean energy transition, that may be more complicated here in the US. You could have some folks, uh, because of the pollution associated with some of the extraction, that may not be uh, that enthusiastic about it. Maybe that's an opportunity for a place like Mexico uh, to potentially get some of those materials. In terms of the Fed, you know, Biden has now reshaped it. If you look at the people that are now on the board, they are, I think, objectively um, more dovish than their predecessors. I think you're seeing a greater emphasis now on employment, at least on the new folks, rather than the price stability mandate. Um, in terms of the focus, at least on the supervisory side, I think Michael Barr's appointment was sort of an acknowledgment in response to Sarah Bloom Raskin not having the votes based on some of the concerns from Republicans and Joe Manchin on fossil fuel. So I don't think that's going to be a priority of the Fed. You know, I look back at the timing of Powell's decision to retire the term transitory. It happened after Biden uh, you know, renominated him. There was some question of whether or not Powell would be reappointed. Delaying the action needed has made his ability to execute a soft landing much more difficult. Um, and I don't know that we're going to necessarily get to the point where we're going to see this new board maybe divided over votes, but when we start getting to these decisions on the margins, how this shapes out is going to be something to keep an eye on. Most people in these senior positions in Washington are concerned about their legacy. And from Powell, at this point, he knows he's going to be the boogeyman for the recession regardless. If he is as committed to being the next Paul Volcker, as he says, if Volcker was somebody who was villainized early on uh, in terms of the immediate actions he was taking, but history has judged him fondly as having the courage to do the right thing. If Powell decides to follow that mold, which he seems to be indicating with his remarks, that's something to, to factor in as well. In terms of 2024, uh, because it starts, I guess, the day after the midterms, we've had two very close elections decided by a relatively small number of votes in a handful of states. I don't think that's going to be any different this next election. Trump and Biden have this odd symbiotic relationship where their whole case for presidency is sort of dependent on the other one being the other party's candidate. From Biden, I think he makes the argument that Trump's next potential threat, I beat him the last time. Uh, it's risky to take a chance on somebody else. Therefore, I should be the nominee moving forward. It's not clear that there's an alternative, and we'll, we'll get to that in a second. From Trump's perspective, you see some of the approval ratings for Biden. It was a close election the last time, um, and the fact that Biden would have to, to potentially run uh, you know, on his record this time. Um, so I think that's something that he's factoring as well. In terms of Biden's comment in 60 Minutes, I wasn't surprised about that. You know, He's aware of where his approval rating is. It may be a drag for Democrats in the midterms. I think that's why he wasn't anxious to double down. And he also said something very practically, that your ability to spend money is restricted once you make that formal declaration uh, for presidency. It's less of an issue for Biden, but it may explain why Trump hasn't formally declared his pres presidential ambitions yet. In terms of the impact, it's all about expectations. In terms of the midterm and what it means for Trump and Biden, Republicans overperform and Trump candidates do well. Trump will say, this is bolsters my case. You should stick with me. Uh, conversely, if 
Democrats overperform, I think there's maybe less of a push to dump Biden. Spring 2023 is about when you'll expect most candidates declare their presidential uh, ambitions. June, if we're going off of what happened four years ago, is when you can expect the first presidential primary debates. Um, it's interesting this time because Republicans are going to stick to the same primary script. We're definitely going to have a presidential primary. We'll see who all gets in it. Um, but in terms of the states, they will remain the same. Democrats have stated that they will go ahead and alter the map. They've had issues with Iowa several times now, but Iowa's not going to be the first contest. They were originally going to announce re the reorder of states uh, before the election. Now they're saying they're going to hold off and do that. Maybe that's in, in some coordination with Biden. Uh, but that's really important in terms of determining who's going to actually win the nomination. Are they going to start with more of a states that might uh, lead them to choose somebody that may be more uh, appealing in a general election? Are you talking about more like Midwestern states? Or are they going to be more progressive states off the bat? Um, that, again, can have a really big outsized sway in terms of who they actually decide. In terms of the potential candidates, you know, we've talked about um, Trump and Biden. I guess start on the Democratic side. Traditionally, it would go to Kamala Harris. I mean, if you just look back historically, the vice president tends to be a lock for um, their party's nomination. However, in terms of polling, she's not done well. I think there's some concerns over her campaign last time. Um, it would be very difficult, again, for Democrats just to sort of pass over her. I'm not sure if Biden were to announce he was going to run, what other Democrats actually feel that she's weak enough politically to jump in. Uh, a name that uh, clearly keeps resurfacing, somebody who has presidential ambitions, is California Governor Gavin Newsom. The question, I think, for somebody like that is, how divided is that progressive lane going to be? When you think back to 2020, you had a lot of different people competing in that lane, and they sort of divided up the boat between Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, Kamala Harris. If somebody like Newsom is the only progressive running in that lane, he might have the ability to go ahead, coalesce, have people coalesce behind him, and ride that to the nomination. Um, something to, to watch there. On the Republican side, you know, it's all a question of whether or not Trump is going to run. Uh, I suspect that there will be several candidates to jump in regardless. Some of them just can't afford to wait, whether that's Mike Pence or somebody like a, a Mike Pompeo. I think there's a question of whether or not Ron DeSantis would jump in. You know, there's been this, I've used this term before, and Frank and I have talked about it, uh, the Ric Flair Republican. To be the man, you got to beat the man. Could somebody like a Ron DeSantis actually defeat Trump in the primary and in the process emerge stronger? And there's some precedent for that on the Democrat side. If you think back to 2008, everybody assumed Hillary Clinton was going to run away with the nomination, and first-term Senator Barack Obama was able to win Iowa. He cleared out the field, made it a one-on-one you know, -on -one race, and was able to prevail. DeSantis would have to do that. I assume he would have to probably win New Hampshire. Polling suggests he'd actually head to Trump there. If the other folks got out of the field, there's a possibility he could do that. If it were a Biden, DeSantis, uh, you know, potential matchup, that would be a quite stark, a very stark contrast. And I think that's the last slide I have. I wanted to add some time for, for questions, um, but thank you. Uh, thank you for that um, whirlwind tour of all things chaotic. Um, with regard to the Ukraine and the way in which you're analyzing numbers, the consensus was that Russia was going to take three days to seven days. That's turned out not to be true because it is isn't a battle between Russia and Ukraine forces the way you showed uh, with China and Taiwan, but more east and west. Mm -hmm. And I think there's similar quality issues as opposed to quantity issues. How do you factor in those intangibles in your analysis? In terms of uh, qualitative issues for, for both sides, I'm, on Russia, it's sort of where are they able to get their support from? I mean, you had Russia meeting with Xi Jinping uh, and President Modi from India. Uh, we don't see them getting the military support yet from there. 
Um, in terms of economic support, being able to offset sell some of their oil, I think that's one of the reasons the sanctions haven't maybe worked as uh, people had hoped. In terms of the U.S. support um, and just the Western Alliance support, I guess I would go back to that sort of comment on what the winter energy is, situation is going to be. And uh, if I think that's sort of Putin's play is to make it more of a, a longer term thing and hoping that that alliance is going to erode in Europe if the sort of the leaders there respond to political pressure due to the higher energy costs. And then from a political standpoint, most of the aid has come from the U.S., and if we have a Republican House, if you look at the polls in terms of support for funding this on Republicans, I mean, it's, it, it, it's not popular. And politicians tend to follow the polls. And so I think that's going back to, you know, will, if we get beyond the winter, what does that look like if we get there? And just a quick follow on. Um, do you think uh, probably the most poli popular politician in the world right now is Zelensky? Do you think Biden's... Uh, heartfelt support of the Ukraine uh, and the collapse of the Russia initiative will have a, a positive political effect uh, domestically for Biden uh, in 2022 and obviously 2024. Well, sure. I think Biden, you know, took some criticism for how the Afghanistan withdrawal went. I think that was one of the reasons, you know, the, politically it would be very difficult for him to afford a, a loss here and having, you know, news coverage of success by Ukraine and backing a winner only, I think, bolsters him politically. Now, in terms of priorities, that's where it sort of get, gets difficult, you know, in terms of where that's going to mean for uh, voters, but I, it, it definitely doesn't hurt. I guess the reason, I'm so, as I'm saying that, there, I have seen polls, too, though, in terms of support for Ukraine, when it sort of links that to inflation, then people start going, well, why do we keep doing this? Why don't you just find a quicker way to resolve this if you're saying that inflation is being caused by that? So it's a little bit of a double-edged sword, but backing a winner traditionally would benefit him, I would assume, then hope, I think, that most people think maybe that means this situation is going to resolve itself. Conversely, Xi Jinping, I mean, I don't think his election's in doubt, but uh, it's not a good look to be sort of associated with Putin right now in terms of further commitment from China. I'd be surprised if they really want to do that much more. But. She's got the mic. Believe I have the mic. <laughs> I'm back. Oh, here. sorry. <laughs> you know, if if the Ukraine situation wasn't bad enough, you know, we're looking at the prospect of an issue with Taiwan. And unlike Ukraine, Taiwan is a small place. There'll be no possibility of China taking portions of it and giving up others. They're either going to take the whole thing or they're not going to take anything. My question to you is, if, if an invasion becomes imminent and our in, intel you know, says so this is going to happen within months or weeks, what, what, in your opinion, is the United States really prepared to do in that situation? I think it would depend on the timing. And the reason I'm, I'm suggesting that is, I go back to the, the chip spill. If it works as intended and we're able to bolster our domestic chip production within three to four years, going back to that 2027 timeline, is there as much political will to come to Taiwan's defense if we're less reliant on them on semiconductors? I hate to be that crass, but I, I, I just wonder what that, what that would be. Um, and you know, I would put our allies there, Japan and Korea, you know, just sort of, I think we'd have to, to coordinate with them. You know, are they willing to help shoulder the, the burden there, at least from the, the Navy, depending on how much time we have before the invasion, they might be um, bear, bear the burn of that early on. I mean, Japan's Navy investments are probably more than, than people realize. I think they would be more in terms of facing an existential concern. But look, if China is able to execute a quick invasion, amphibious invasion of the island, the losses the U.S. would suffer to try to take it back would be catastrophic. I just think that'd be very difficult politically to convince people that that was worth it here. I'm hoping we don't have to get there, um, but I, that, that would be difficult to sell. Hi. Um, so it seems like a lot is riding on the state of the economy, right? Inflation. Do you guys have a view on inflation range by end of the year? I have to yield to my <laughs> to, 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 to my economist there. Um, 
I mean, I think you're you're talking about another what, before the end of the year, maybe a point in a quarter in, in terms of ice. So maybe do one more seventy-five basis point, maybe one fifty basis, or I think that's sort of what they're. If I recall what if I understood what he said correctly, I believe that's what he was was, was forecasting. But there's a question too. I mean, is you know the goal traditionally was two percent in inflation. Is four percent going to become the new two percent? Is that enough to declare victory? I don't know. It's an open-ended question. It goes back to like PAL that commitment and what is that composition of the board? How do they define success moving forward? Oh, sorry. sorry. Oh, sorry. Hello. Hi. Oh, hi. Thanks. Um, thanks for this. Um, Impressively comprehensive review. Um, very dense. I think we all are taking pictures of your slides. Did you hear um, that, Frank? <laughs> the, uh, you mentioned, I wanted to just hear if you thought that climate change and climate policy had any impact on any of the election tracking that, that you're following. I know I saw maybe one reference to it, both globally, uh, but also domestically. In terms of the priorities for voters, I mean, more Democrats mention it in terms of a priority for them, but just comparatively speaking, it's still relatively low. If I remember some of the polls, I've seen maybe at 15% you know, for them, uh, which is, I mean, it's not registering on the Republican side and it's not anywhere close to that on the independent side. Um, but in terms of animus towards Trump, uh, the abortion, they tend to be the, the more motivating issues uh, this time. But I think we talk about this idea of coming home. You know, maybe there were some dissolution Democrats before they were able to pass, called the Inflation Reduction Act. Because if you look at it, it seems to be mostly focused on uh, climate. If you were encouraged by that, I think that's going to be something that you could point to as more motivating to, to turn them out this time. You know, the reason I, I sort of uh, think about what a Republican reaction uh, might be, and I didn't get into it in, in this chart, but I, I've written about it several times, and you look at what's going on in a lot of the states in terms of banning access uh, for firms that pursue uh, you know, ESG on the asset management side, you know, particularly BlackRock. Larry Fink is going to be hauled up there a lot next year if there's a Republican House, and you know, sort of taking that political battle now to the, the, the states and the ESG side from Republican governed areas where fossil fuel is a big producer. I, I don't think that's, that's going away. And if we talk about that 2024 scenario, if you had a Republican presidential candidate win with a Republican Senate in, in pretty large margins, I suspect you might see some effort to maybe pass some bills that would, would nationalize some of these things that we've seen in some of these Republican governed states. Hi. Um, in all of your analysis of the way elections are heading, I, I presume that there's an understanding of a deficiency in the precedent of democratic process. It seems like there's been a big rise over the past few years of attempts to subvert you know, the pure democratic process, politically driven gerrymandering, lack of acknowledgement of democratic elections. Is that something that you're able to take into account in your statistical analysis, or is that an externality that uh, is hard to to you know, analyze right now, it, 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 I would. It's hard to quantify now, just because I would say it's, it's a relatively new thing. Um, but I go back to you know 2020 and why maybe those polls were were off. We talked about some of the changes to how the voting occurred and trying to anticipate some of these challenges moving forward. Um, I don't know that there's. Uh, it wasn't captured correctly in 2020, and I don't have any reason to believe that the 2022 pollsters are going to capture it any better this time. Um, I do have one question. Sure. So, I don't know, interest rates have gone up in less than a year, probably close to 400 basis points, and they're going to continue to go, according, go up according to Powell. And coming back to our industry, my personal view is uh, investors' investments are not set up for that velocity of interest rates going up, either not properly hedged or they're not going to be able to refinance loans that are maturing. And there's not much levers the Fed has if they're going to continue to raise interest rates to fight uh, inflation. and based on what you said, we're most likely headed into divided government or closely divided 
So what, what's your firm advising clients in terms of the near-term opportunities and prospects and how to manage that, or is it just pain and suffering coming down the next six months? I want to say it's more the latter. I mean, you listen to Powell, it's no pain, no gain. He just says that, you know, the, it's tough to prove potentially a counterfactual, but he's saying if we don't do this enough, going back to the 70s when they didn't raise it enough and had to go back and it was worse, um, I, I suspect that that's where he's coming down from. Um, but, you know, I, I just know in terms of sector-specific things, I mean, it, 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 obviously growth is <laughs> not done well, to put it politely, in this environment. Uh, but if you want to look... Um, at some of the geopolitical tensions we've mentioned, it's probably a good opportunity for aerospace and defense. But in terms of uh, rates, uh, we'll see. I mean, maybe if it's going to be more dependent on the employment side of things, if it does start to, it tends to be a lagging indicator. If we start to see some of the progress there, maybe that gives Powell uh, more incentive to call off the, the dog, so to speak. Great. Well, join me in thanking Steve.